you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. We found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? It was a research facility. That was all that we were going to tell them. The Russians have been spending millions of dollars investigating so-called ESP. Psychic spies. Almost a psychic arms race here. Is there any real application to this? I think remote viewing has been demonstrated over the 20 years of work that's been sponsored by the government. Producing crucial and vital intelligence to the NSA, CIA, DEA, and the Secret Service. I began to feel frightened. The KGB did it, man. What's really going on here? State-sponsored assassination attempt. The CIA was lying. They wanted to kill the program. A storm brewing. This is real. I say no more secrets. Let this information out. Excellent. Well, it's, grad it's great to actually hook up. It's, it's been a while. I know we've uh, kind of swapped messages back and forth for quite a while now. Yeah, it's uh, um, it, it is, and and I follow a lot of what you do, you know, just on your channel and stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm, uh, we're probably in the same Facebook groups or something, and I just every now and then I'll see a cool video that you're doing. It's great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to put out as much as we can. Uh, it all came out because the uh, the virus really, you know, and people wanted to get together because they couldn't meet, so ended up doing the Friday night chats, and uh, yeah, it's just continued from there really. Uh, and so like a growing wealth of shared information, so it's good for the community that's great that's great yeah i didn't even realize you were in the uk until you said that the uh the timeline difference i just didn't realize mm -hmm. all right yeah 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 so it's like uh just gone midnight here for me now at the moment oh my gosh but thank you for, for staying up for late for me yeah that's okay that's, that's not a problem uh, i think what i was trying to tell you the other day was uh when i meet with my because i'm in this group called crypto viewing this remote viewing business and uh the rest of the guys in that, the four guys I meet at once a week where we record our videos, they're all in the uh, US. Uh -huh. So we we don't get to meet until uh, 1.30 in the morning, my time, I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm the only one in the UK. I'm the kind of odd one out and I have to, I have to be one that suffers. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so I have to do that on a Tuesday night. Uh, and that means I'm up for I'm up from one one thirty in the morning till four thirty in the morning doing the videos for that. So that that's a bit of a kicker. You know, you know, I I uh, because I'm sort of on my own schedule. I I you know work mostly freelance and I'm uh, working remotely. Uh, most of the time I'm up like super late anyway. And, and my whole family is actually like we have a we have a four year old. Like everybody, you know, like uh, it just we're, we all start, sort of get up late and then I work really late. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Excellent. Well, it's great that we're actually connecting. Uh, what really intrigued me about what you did, you know, obviously is your video, The Third Eye Spies, you know, which is a spectacular piece of work. And I, mm -hmm. I hope it was really successful for you. It, it looks like it was. I, you know, I see it on all the major channels out there. Yeah, it's uh, um, it's doing well. I mean, it's um, Third Eye Spies is still um, available um, worldwide, I think, everywhere on um, online platforms. So if you have iTunes, if you have um, or Apple TV, uh, Roku, Roku, I think it's out now, Amazon, um, Hulu, you know, um, YouTube even, you know, it's actually up on YouTube now. So you can just go on YouTube and see it. Uh, that's actually a legitimate video now like there had been a few people who were pirating it on youtube and i think the distributor finally just decided to go ahead and just put it up there on youtube for free to people to watch so it's Excellent. on amazon prime for free or it's on youtube for free yeah you 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 do get uh like a benefit from that though do, do you get payment out of them um, not free? a lot but i do yeah yeah mm -hmm. excellent yeah mm -hmm. every little bit helps i guess doesn't it nowadays yes yes it does yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was a great film, and I uh, and I know that uh, a lot of the people in the community are always discussing it and talking about it. I think it made a really big impact, and it was one of the most positive and one of the one of the most professionally done ones. You know, because we've all seen documentaries in the past, but they've had a little bit of uh, I don't know what's the showmanship about them, or they've been a bit a bit skeptical. Whereas yours was straight down the line with the hard facts of it all. Yeah, thank you. I um, 
I want to think, were you there at that uh, conference in Vegas that we filmed uh, the, uh, um, was it Irva? Uh, were you, were no. you there? No. Uh, to date, uh, I haven't gone to an Irva conference yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, but it's, uh, it, what was so great about, you know, doing that documentary was um, seeing everything happen in real time, you know, and, and actually being able to film some real remote viewings. Yeah. And, um, and there was a lot of stuff that didn't even make it in the film, you know, and, and I started off making the film Third Eye Spies. Um, I wouldn't say I was skeptical. I was, I was open, but I was a discerning skeptic. You know, I, I didn't come in with like an agenda of like, okay, I'm going to prove this. You know, now my producer with me on the project was Russell Targ. And obviously Russell Targ has an agenda because Russell is one of the co-founders of the entire, you know, SRI yeah. program and, and sort of helped Ingo Swan and uh, Hal put off, bring that kind of phrase to, to the world. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, neither one of us were looking to sort of create a fluff piece about remote viewing. It was, it was cause it wasn't so much about having to prove it because it had already been proved scientifically for going back a hundred years, even, I mean, all of the different research that, that has been done in different places, it was more sort of just making people understand the kind of inevitability of it. Um, and, and, and really though, when I started, I started kind of thinking, you know, is this guy, Russell Targ, trying to con me? I mean, like, what, what is this? Because the stuff that he was talking about was so extraordinary. Yeah. You know, I really had to go out and do a lot of my own research initially to say, okay, let me fact check a lot of these things that he's talking yeah. about. And, and yeah, I mean, th those things all happened. And, yeah. uh, you know, literally when we met, you know, he, Russell had called me out of the blue through a friend that, that knew me um, because he had seen Six String Samurai, which was my first uh, feature film that I'd done as a yeah. filmmaker. And um, which actually just got re-released um, in May. They re-released a 4K version of it on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, he had seen it and he had wanted to do a narrative film and he, had, uh, and he was shopping around this script to do a narrative film. And so he called me and I had just so happened recently to have read a book that talked about his work with Hal Putoff uh, studying remote viewing. So I already kind of knew a little bit about him, yeah. but not the entire story. And um, so when he called me, we hit it off over the phone and I said, Russell, you know, your script's interesting, but, you know, it's very hard to make a narrative, big budget, you know, feature film. I said, you know, why not make a documentary about your life and about this, you know, this, this program. Yeah. And, and, uh, and around that time, it was about a little less than a year after Ingo had just passed away. Right. And and uh, so he said, you know, he said, we're not as young as we used to be. And there's a lot of people who I work with who are no longer around. Ingo, my friend just died. You know, he said, sure, let's let's uh, let's talk more about that. And uh, he said, I'll come out to L.A. and meet you. So he he showed up in, in L.A. literally at my front door, maybe a few weeks later with this big briefcase full of documents, like with all the documents just like falling out of it, you know, like so huge. <laughs> yeah. And and we spent a weekend at my house. Uh, and he just was like putting out pieces of paper on, on a table and going, you know, look, we did this, we did this, we did this. And I remember after the first night, like going to bed and thinking, oh my God, did I, what have I gotten involved with here? What is this? And, and, and I literally thought like, you know, is this guy schizophrenic? I mean, is he showing up and just with all this stuff that I haven't heard of? And I, and I have had my own, you know, experiences that, that are unexplainable. I've had a, enough experience to know that the world is a more mysterious place than we sort of give it credit for. But still to me, I was like, okay, this is too much. And, 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 and literally like the, the day before he went back to where he lives, um, we both stood there at my kitchen table after going through all of this. And by then I had kind of like written out like a whole sort of treatment as to how this thing could work and like, what could we do? And, um, and we both kind of looked at each other and he said, you don't think the CIA is going to come after us for this, do you? <laughs> <laughs> he said, we maybe we need to be careful about this. And, and, you know, we didn't talk about anything that wasn't declassified, but yes. um, yeah. it's just such a wealth of information that is out there about yeah. remote viewing. And, and uh, it's so well documented and so proven it, but it's kind of, I think, outside of people's understanding of reality. Yeah. And, and when you deal with something that is not in your worldview, you know, it, it's very difficult to change that because there's nothing that a lot of people can kind of grasp onto, which really is why I think in the world of remote viewing um, at SRI, 
they would never show people their data. They would say, sit down today, you're going to be the remote viewer and then yes. make them the viewer. Yes. And then they'd get it. And, and, and I think that really is an accurate sort of way. You, you, you have to sort of literally um, expose someone to something like that firsthand. Yeah. We couldn't do that literally in the documentary, but we wanted to get as close as possible you know, to, to just sort of showing the inevitability of this. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and it's, that's great hearing all this after, you know, because uh, I've seen the documentary several times now, um, because the documentary is so well put together. Uh, it, it doesn't come across that you were, you know, you didn't know much about remote viewing before you started this. And it's like, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, that, that revelationary uh, uh, kind of effect you had sat around that table. So that's, that's, a, that's a, you know, a great ode to you, really. You did some a fantastic piece of work there, I think. And I think it's going to stand the test of time and be one of the uh, documentaries that people into remote viewing are going to talk about for many oh, years to come. Well, uh, first of all, you know, we are going to do a, um, I am working on a sort of a um, director's cut as well with some of the missing material and things that Excellent. we didn't put in it. I was going to ask about that. Yes. Yeah. So, so we are working on something, you know, um, you know, to, to do with it. And, um, you know, the other thing is, yes, I started out as, as someone who didn't know much about the actual remote viewing. I mean, many, many, many years ago, uh, as a kid, I had read about army remote viewers uh, in Reader's Digest. You know, while the program was still classified uh, yes. in the 80s, probably, um, you know, I had read this article. My grandmother used to collect Reader's Digest. I mean, she would get the Reader's Digest every week. And, and, uh, and I happened to read one, and I thought to myself, even back then as a kid, I thought this would make an amazing story. You know, these, these guys that do this and, and the story was approached. So um, matter of factly, it was somebody that had been in the army or was still or something that had been writing about this, that I thought this is coming across very real. I said, if nothing else, this is going to make a great movie someday. And, and I, and I kept this kind of dog-eared reader's digest for many, many years, all through college. I went to film school. I thought, well, this would be interesting. And then I, um, but I'd never done any other research beyond just this, this one article. And uh, over the years, I lost the article and then I kind of forgot all about it and several years went by. But, but uh, you know, it's, I didn't know a lot about actually remote viewing, but I also spent, I mean, I think it took us four years to complete the documentary. And oh, that's okay. mostly because I was doing everything. I mean, I was, yeah. I was, I had, you know, occasionally we had some extra crew come in and, and help if I could afford, if I could afford to uh, pay someone. But most of the time I, you know, um, literally was just me. So, um, okay. So it doesn't come across that, you know, it does look like a, a, a piece of work that you'd imagine that, you know, had sound engineers, directors, you know, no, I did the, everything on it. I did the sound. I, I just early on, I had some, uh, some additional help, but, but, uh, um, the, the, the issue with documentaries is that uh, you wind up with hundreds of hours of footage, you know, you yeah. wind up with just so much footage because you just kind of let people talk yes. a lot of times. Yeah. And then you, so you get just hours and hours of footage and then you have to sit there and make sense of it. So, so, you know, and I have a long background in, in, in filmmaking. I've done other films and yeah. a lot of narrative filmmaking and that kind of thing, even music videos and TV and things like that. But um, I really became obsessed with this topic and um, it was like having a master class taught by the very, very best people yeah. in history that, that, ha that are known for doing this. And, and uh, um, to spend literally years back and forth talking about it with Russell Targ in, in particular, but with other people as well, um, I feel like I, I really just got like such a wonderful college education, yeah, you know, in, in this yeah. whole thing. And so by the time I finished the documentary, that's why you probably get that feeling like, wow, we, and then plus also, I mean, it was being overseen by Russell's heart, who, yeah. who it was constantly a battle back and forth between Russell and I, in a sense, because Russell wanted the film to accurately reflect the scientific work, yes. you know, and every little detail of the scientific work. And, and after a while, your eyes roll back in your head. And you, I can't take any more data. Don't tell me anything else. I get it. Yeah. And, and, and so we were constantly having this back and forth of like, just creatively, which, which was great because um, it made it accurate. And at the end of the day, if it had just been a scientist making it, it would have been more like a PowerPoint presentation, but we, we yes. kept trying to say, okay, wh where's the, 
the cinematics of this? Like, how can we move the story forward? And, yeah. and, um, and it is actually a very cin cinematic story. I mean, you know, the, the, the whole story of Pat Price and the spy versus spy and yeah. all of that is yeah. very interesting and intriguing and mysterious. And so, so that, that made it a lot of fun, but I mean, I had so many test screenings and, uh, you know, at Irv, the reason I asked if you were at Irv was because very early on, we showed a, a cut uh, of about 45 minutes at Irva. Yeah. And it went very well, you know, it went very well because at 45 minutes, it was pretty tight. And there was, it was yeah. only like a little piece of the film. And then I came back like a year or two later and I showed, I don't know, two hours or more, two hours and 30 minutes of the film. And it was still a rough cut, you know, right. at that point. And, and uh, what I tend to do is I'll stand off to the side and I won't watch the movie. I'll watch everybody watching the movie. And I do this with every, every single one of my films. I mean, I'll just be in the room and feel the energy of the room, you know, yeah. and, and how, how are people reacting to the film? Where does it lull? And you, you could kind of tell like when people start to tune out because there's just so much information there. And yeah. then afterwards I'd talk to Russell and I'd be like, all right, we need to cut another 20 minutes out of this thing. We need to keep going forward with it. Yeah. You know, we need to kind of improve it. So it, the luxury of not really having a large budget is, mm -hmm. is that, you have more time, you know, yeah. like time is your friend and it's your enemy, yeah. you know, and, and uh, we were able to, you know, I'm, I was able to kind of put it aside every now and then and just kind of think about it and go, okay, how else would I do this? Uh, but um, yeah, it just takes forever. It's a grueling process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, as you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm keen to see this extended uh, version now, especially I, you know, cause I, I don't know if you know much about me, but I'm a bit of a, history buff of removing you know, i've collected everything for like two and a half decades now mm -hmm. you know like i've I, i've, I've databased the entire stargate archives back the front put it in chronological order and, and you know i can search inside each page for keywords if i want to and mm -hmm. i'm that much of a nut that's great so the nut so it's so for me knowing that you have all this uh hardcore kind of uh information that you've you know you've recorded from people that we know mm -hmm. are getting older and they are going to yeah you know, pass on very, not very soon but you know they're in their later stage of their life that's uh that's in, that's important that you have that you know and it'd be great yeah. at some point if if all that was went somewhere you know one of the like one of the archives like the university of west georgia because they're they seem to be collecting all the remote viewing information from everyone nowadays yeah I, I, for sure the information is not going to remain uh dormant you know like we're we're I'm, I'm actively looking for uh things to do you know it's like yeah. it, it worst worst case scenario is i'll just start putting stuff up on youtube you know yeah. and and yeah. put up long form interviews you know at, at this stage though i'm still looking to um just figure out the best way to to utilize um you know stuff and and i've continued to collect stuff i mean i've yeah. just continued to shoot stuff i mean i've Excellent. i've gone out and shot a few times with uh you know marty rosenblatt and the stuff they're doing with arv and yeah and and you know the, that kind of stuff and um we've had groups here like you know at my at my studio like where where every now and then we'll have a group i i don't i'm not a really active person in terms of actually doing it myself but um i wonder about love that. Yeah. talking about it and i love you know, um, I, for a long time, I kind of subscribed to the model of that, that Russell subscribed to, which is the scientist shouldn't be involved in the actual work yeah. because, you know, then you get really fully bought in, you know, and you become yeah. a believer and then it shows up in your work. Yeah. There's a bias then, isn't there? Yeah. 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 So, so I, I tried to be careful about that, but, yeah. but uh, at the same time, you know, it's just the inevitability of the data. Yeah. Like, like people ask Russell all the time, like, you know, like, is, do you believe in remote viewing or is, or does, should I believe in this? And it's like, you, you, when you believe in something, you're taking it as a matter of, of faith. Yeah. What, what his response, which I love is, is, well, I don't believe in lasers. I spent, he spent, you know, years as a scientist working on lasers. He says, and I don't say, I believe lasers will hurt you or that lasers are real. They are real, yeah. you know, and you can see this by the evidence of your eyes. And, yes. and I think that that's, uh, really the case when it comes to this sort of ability is that you yeah. start to see the the inevitability of the information itself yeah. and and that makes it very hard to argue with but where I think a lot of the skepticism comes in is that it's a very convoluted story you know and there's and it's not perfectly perfectly replicable mm -hmm. so so you can't go into a lab and hit a button and then get the expected result Absolutely. every time yeah. You know, and, and, you know, consciousness is very slippery yes. and, and it goes all over the place and it does all kinds of crazy things. And maybe the observer effect comes into play or maybe the, 
uh, you know, decline effect or, or, or whatever it is, but in a lab, you know, you, it's very hard to put your finger on it, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. it's, if it doesn't, so if it's not working hundred percent of the time, then it's hard to come up with that scientific theory yes. of how it works. And, and uh, you know, like when we interviewed um, Ken Kress, uh, who was the um, original CIA program monitor for um, the SRI program, and he had never done an interview. He had never come forward. He was operating in secret um, as an undercover CIA operative for uh, program manager for many years. He was a, yeah. a physicist. And um, and he told me, I asked him, I said, well, how do you think all this stuff works? And we spent a lot of time together. Ken and I uh, hung out at his house, I think, for like a good week, you yeah. know, and, and uh, where he lives. And, and uh, he lives up in the mountains and he's got the secluded area. He's kind of a hunter. He yeah. did a little fishing then. Right. That's right. We did fishing. We, we yeah. did, uh, you know, just, and he and his wife were very gracious. Um, his wife, uh, they, they took us on a big tour of uh, a Yellowstone park. Oh, yeah. Actually it was just me. Russell wasn't even there. And I, and so I spent an entire day just driving around Yellowstone, you know, and talking to him. Yes. And I, and I asked him actually on that trip, I said, you know, how do you think remote viewing works? I said, do you believe, you know, like yeah, there's a, there's a process of understanding it. And he said, I have no idea. He says, and I never cared how it works. He says, all I cared was, did it work or did it not work? He said that, that the CIA, he said, is not who you want doing scientific experiments <laughs> or research. He says, yeah. he says, we didn't care how it worked. He says, uh, of course, we, we want to know because that means it's legit. But yeah. once we were able to definitively prove that, yes, this was a real phenomenon and it works, from that point, all we asked is, was it useful or not? you know yeah. and and if it was useful we're going to use it if it's not useful we're going to discard it yeah. and 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 that made a lot of sense to me you know yeah. that that you know you, you wouldn't deal with the intelligence community if you really want to learn how it operates and and i think yeah. that was uh the source of frustration that russell had as a scientist because um yeah. you know how was his background was uh you know he was a military guy i mean he was at least you know navy uh you know he had done some stuff he he had maybe a little bit more regimented way of, of yeah. thinking. Russell was a little bit more bohemian, you know, a, a little bit more sort of, um, you know, just wanting to show the whole world this was a real thing. And so, yeah. so the, those things stopped aligning after a while. Yeah. You know, fantastic. Yeah, great, great background on that. And um, with all this extra information, uh, have you thought maybe you know getting some crowdfund? I mean, is it a case of resources for putting this out? Because you know. The, com the RV community itself would probably crowdfund or, or source uh, an extended cut, something like that, I would, I would have thought. You know, I hadn't thought of that. And, and, and that's a possibility. I mean, um, you know, that, that is possible. I mean, it really, uh, it, it just comes down to me, man. I mean, I'm, 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 uh, you know, you're, you're, when you're trying to like keep the lights on and, and yeah. just make a living and, and have a family and everything else, it's like, it's stuff just slows down to a crawl and it's, it's yeah. really on me to um definitively pick a direction and and go with it from there you know it's like a but if you know if you ever need any help with anything along the lines of anything to do with what, what you want to do with your project and remote viewing you know i'm more than happy to help and i have a, a bit of reach in the community on many different levels so i, I can help in any way i that I come for thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. You know, yeah, it'd be means... fantastic. I, just, I, love, yeah. I love the documentary. And uh, if you have a more available data, and I, you know, I, I, being doing filming and stuff myself, I know that you have tons of B row and all sorts. It'd be fantastic yeah. to see, you know, all that other stuff got out there at some point as well. So that, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, I still have interviews that, that uh, I loved, you know, doing both at that time and after the fact. And, and, uh, it's just a matter, I mean, you know, COVID sort of put a kink in everybody's yeah. Yeah. plans. Like, you know, I, I had planned on actually starting another documentary right when COVID hit. Yeah. Um, I, I was doing something sort of quasi-related and um, it, and I, everything got put on hold. <laughs> you know, yeah. so just everything yeah. got put on hold. And, 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 I, and, I, and then I actually branded, branched off into doing um, animated work like my what i'm doing now like you can see behind me i have kind of this like little studio here yes and yes. and uh, i have like a green screen, green screen i have like yeah. some other things and 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 uh um now i'm actually even thinking about doing uh some of uh the stories as animations you oh, know like yeah. that's that's a like incorporating you know sort of the underlying uh materials and you know doing doing that that might be a possibility yeah that, that might put an interesting yeah. slant on it yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the things that um, I'd really love to do is to get into the head of somebody that does remote viewings all the time and, and actually be able to visually portray that. Like, what does it really feel like and, and look like for a remote viewer to do a remote viewing? Yes. Like, how are you perceiving these things? Yeah. And, and uh, so I think you can only really do that through some sort of um, CGI, you know, advanced animation, you know, kind of technique. Animation would help on that, I think. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so that's another thing. Because, you yeah. know, uh, I might be able to help on that being a person that, you know, pretty much on every, every week I'm doing three or four remote viewing sessions. And it's all for the last four years, it's all paid work as well. So oh, good. So, you're yeah, working with, the, with clients. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. well, we, uh, the company we have called Crypto Viewing, uh, there's four remote viewers and there's probably eight to 12 full and part-time support staff. So it's, it's a fair, it's, it's a growing business. Mm -hmm. And we essentially uh, do predictions on, on the markets and cryptocurrencies for clients. But our okay. client is a, it's a different model than the other people. You know, we fought outside the box where traditional remote viewers, they tried to go to a business to client relationship. Uh, we decided to use the internet and we essentially uh, have patrons, subscribers that mm -hmm. pay a monthly fee each month. We have thousands of those. So the monthly that's fee great. helps yeah. support us on, on, a, on a month by month basis. So that's your full time job. Yeah. For four, for three and a half years now, myself How and four other remote viewers have been paid full time to, to put out remote viewing content for our subscribers. That's really great, man. That's really great. How great of a model is that? Uh, I'll, I'll give you my two cents on on predicting. Um, it, just to, based on conversations I've had with with Russell and some of these other guys. Yep. Um, Russell, I know, has gotten into arguments with other scientists in this area, healthy arguments, creative arguments, um, because his his thing, and I can I can get behind what he's thinking, is that if you're going to do like ARV, like predictive remote viewing. Yep. Um, that there's there's really two ways to do it. Um, one is that you have an entirely new batch of like college kids or you know people who have never done it before, uh, you know each time, you know yeah. so that so that you don't result in this sort of uh, ego getting in the way or or you, you know people's fears, you know th this kind of thing, yes. uh, which yes. contaminates the the later remote viewings. Yeah. Um, or you use a computer, you know, and and don't let anybody know, you know, like like what the uh, any of the information or the target or anything is let yeah. the computer randomly generate it. So like if you had five different things you wanted to remote view, for example, like, you know, you would program all that into the computer and it's completely random as to which one you're going to do first, yes. you yeah. know, because then it, it takes away, uh, there's something about it statistically, if too much information is known anywhere by anyone, you know, it, it doesn't always work as well, you know, but oh, if yeah. it's through a computer, there's no consciousness that's looking at it, you yes. know, and, yes. and, and what they find again and again is that uh, consciousness, I'm sure you know this, it, 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 it can interfere, you know, Absolutely. with, with yeah. remote viewing. Yeah, and yeah. it's, you know, it's a problem, it's a problem with ARV and, and normal remote viewing really, because um, we just don't know the limit, you know, we don't know the mechanism of remote viewing. And, you know, we have a, we have a tasker over here who blindly sets a target to the remote viewers over here, who have to kind of connect to that task or to find out what that is so that can only be done through some kind of telepathic connection in some way and you know we know the experimenter effect as well so anyone that's running the experiment has an impact on the experiment mm -hmm. and my belief is as well that anyone that views that experiment in the future you know because all our stuff is public mm -hmm. uh, so we have thousands of subscribers that are, are viewing our results i think that they probably have an effect at some point on on what we're remote viewing as well so it, it gets to be a, a quagmire of yeah capability yeah. really yeah, that's, and I know we wanted to talk about this, so it's a good time to bring it up, is um, I'll toot my own horn for a minute and say that it, it's incredibly possible that the reason that SRI back in the day was getting such great data is because starting in 2014 or 15, we started making a movie about it. And, and so much consciousness has now been placed into watching that film yeah. that, that it makes it really easy for a viewer in the past to, to say, okay, I'm looking for the biggest splash about my target. You know, yes. like what's easiest for the consciousness to go out there and grab onto. Absolutely. And, and it, it very well could be. And, and uh, I, I bring that up in part because, um, you know, like Hella Hammett's first remote viewing. That's um, what I wanted to ask you about the, yeah. the open, you know, because I heard your, I, what intrigued me is I heard you give a radio interview a couple of years ago on um, a radio show, Mysterious Universe podcast. Yes. And you mm -hmm. talked about the Hedda Hamid overpass. Yes. And, and 
and I wanted you to go through that because I, I heard that at the time and I literally I was I was walking down the street and I just stopped. I was like, whoa. Yeah. The, the implications for this just mind boggling for me. Yeah. And that's why I, I've been dying to get you on to, just, to literally just talk about that alone because that that alone just just freaks me right out. That's just. Yeah. 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 So so um, Hella Hammond, we should set it up for people who may not know. Uh, was a control subject. Um, at, at the time at SRI, um, their contract monitor, um, either it was Kit Green or, or Ken Kress, I don't know which, probably Kit Green at that time, because uh, it was later, um, said, um, we want to see what a negative result looks like. We want to see what somebody with no psychic ability looks like when they try to do a remote viewing. Yeah. And, and so Russell thought about it and went, well, I have this friend. She's a... Um, life magazine photographer you know very uh glamorous classy woman you know um named hella hammond uh and she's sures me up and down she's never done anything psychic in her life let's bring her in and then see a uh, test her you know and see what the baseline is and and uh hella eventually turned out to be the, uh, statistically their very very best remote viewer you know like they she got better results than pat price ingo swan Anybody like statistically, uh, you know, she just had more hits than anybody else. Yeah. And uh... for many parapsychologists, the question is no longer does remote viewing exist, but how does it work? Hella Hamid is a professional photographer and also a successful remote viewer. In a series of 10 experiments at Stanford Research Institute, she was asked to look inside a sealed canister from 200 yards away. To assess the limits of remote viewing, they wanted to discover how small an object the viewers could see. Hella Hamid was right seven times. In one experiment, she made this drawing and said her strongest image was like a belt. Inside the can was this leather belt key ring. In another experiment, she described a long, thin, silver-coloured object with a nail head at the end. The hidden target was a bobbin and pin. Um, so they brought her in for the very, very first time. And um, the way they would do it at SRI is they would use a random number generator. Um, and they had like 50 envelopes in a safe downstairs. And so like a number from 1 to 50. Uh, and then whatever that number hit, then somebody would go down and get the envelope and without handing it, without um, uh, opening it, they would give it to, say, Hal or somebody uh, who would then get in a car and drive somewhere in Palo Alto and hide. You know, um, he, when he had driven away from SRI, then he opens the envelope that gives him um, the address or the location, wherever it is that he's supposed to go. And then he goes there and then um, the remote viewer is supposed to say, OK, where are you? You know, and um, so that's what they did that morning with Hella. As we proceeded in our work, um, <clears throat> we began noticing certain features that, that, that were pretty interesting. Uh, I remember a specific example where, for example, I was sent out to uh, stand on a uh, walk, crosswalk over a freeway, and it was an encaged kind of place. The remote viewer, Hella Hammond in this case, drew a really excellent description of the sort of cage that I was in, indicated that things were going by fast, and yet didn't actually recognize that I was over a freeway and that these things going by fast were cars. Well, that kind of uh, sort of pattern began to emerge more and more. We began to realize, well, these people seem to be getting sort of patterns and kind of a holistic elements of a scene but their analysis or their interpretation uh, is often not there at all or faulty. People it was Russell and Hella in a, in a um, room at SRI and Hal had gone off to go hi uh, hide somewhere. And uh, where he happened to, to open the envelope and see that day was a overpass. It was a freeway overpass. And so um, he did that. And Hella gave a... Um, very, very good description of the overpass. And she drew, you know, objects and things about the overpass that were very accurate, um, which you can see in, in Third Eye Spies. Um, and so that was that, you know, great remote viewing, you know, wonderful. Um, and, and that was the first of many, many, many remote viewings that she would do for SRI. Um, well, many years later, um, we got the tape of that, of that remote viewing. And, um, 
even before I had gotten the tape, um, we went back to that overpass to film it, you know, and, and uh, only this time I didn't have Hal, it was Russell yes. who I had, who went up, up the overpass. So I filmed Russell going up the overpass with his jacket on and, you know, he's older, he's kind of hunched over and he has to kind of use the railing to help himself get up the, the steps. And, you know, he stands up there on the overpass. And um, when I took that footage back and I was playing this, this tape months later, uh, we realized that in many instances, it sounded as if Hello was sort of viewing kind of a hybrid between Hal and Russell. Yeah. And a lot of that was in the uh, sort of the gray areas of the, of the thing where they thought that she just kind of got it wrong or, or whatever, you know, she said, uh, for example, um, you know, Russell, uh, I'm sorry, Hal is at this location about, you know, three stories up and he's going up some stairs and he's holding onto the railing and he's sort of hunched over. It almost looks like he's wearing a backpack, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, Russell with his jacket on and, and uh, it kind of hunched over the way he walks and, you know, kind of, her, he, he said, he, I think she even said something like, I wonder if something's wrong with Hal, you know, and, and, uh, and I thought, my God, it's, it sounds like she's describing Russell in 2014, not Hal in 1970, whatever, four, yeah. you know, yeah. so, and then uh, at, at a certain point, she says there's some sort of um, obstruction or there's something like, I, I don't remember exactly the words now, but it was like, there's something in the middle of the thing and he has to kind of go around it and and uh i mean i was able to basically make that part sync up like where you know russell goes through this uh it's one of those fences they put in the middle of the overpass for a bike yeah um, a bike stop you ride your bike yeah so it's like yes you have to walk your bike around it yeah. and then i found out that wasn't put there until like the 90s you know and and yeah. so she was describing something that wasn't there yet yeah. you know she was describing it much yeah. much later and so when you when you take all of these different things and, and she also would describe things like there was greenery around and uh, like Ivy around the bottom of it. And I don't even know if I used that in the film, but um, cause it wasn't that crucial to the film, but um, yes, there was greenery. I don't know if there was in 1974, but you know, like there was definitely greenery there in, in the 2000s. So it's, it's um, what it suggests is that it's very possible that she went and looked at her own. Yeah tape of the or the her own movie version of that and then kind of yeah. combined it because she also said other things that were more related to how like like in the tape she said something like uh it's sunset or i can see the sun on the horizon or something like that and it wasn't that that day you know and and so there, there was this mixture of of maybe the two events you know but because that remote viewing was so popularized in our film it was easy for her to see. And, and yes. what also made me think that was um, the description that Pat Price originally gave regarding the, um, the spheres at semi Palatinsk. Um, you know, Pat Price, most famous remote viewer probably ever, you know, like for, for the stuff that he, he was doing, uh, really kind of kicked off the whole program with this viewing of semi Palatinsk in Siberia, yeah. which was a top secret site that um, the Russians were using for something. And the US government didn't know what it was. And they had pointed satellites at it and they didn't know what was going on. And um, one of the things that Pat described were these giant spheres made out of gores, like yeah. these strips of metal. And um, they had been welded together. They were having problems with the welding, he said. And, um, and he described it as kind of like some sort of an energy beam weapon yeah. and um, used kind of very specific descriptors. And the way he described it it almost sounded like he was cribbing from an article that was written two years after his death in Scientific American. Because at the time of the viewing, um, the CIA was convinced he was onto something because he got a lot of things right about that location. Yeah. But the CIA didn't know anything about the, the spheres which were buried underground there. Yeah. And so they thought that was just a miss. And they thought that for years until years later, Scientific American writes uh, this article because I don't know if somebody defected or if the Soviets finally revealed it. I think they've actually revealed it. And, um, and they uh, allowed some inspection of the site because of some treaty or something. And, and uh, so Scientific American writes an article about these spheres buried underground, made out of gores that nobody knew about. And um, the way Pat described it in his viewing, it sounded as if he was reading the article. 
Yes. You know, so so the article came out after he died, oh, no, two amazing. two three years after he died. So it's it's almost, and we've seen this in a lot of these remote viewings where um, you'll find that, like Hella did this a lot. So did Ingo. Um, they're describing their own feedback. You know, like they're it's easier for them to describe their own feedback than it is to go to the actual target. You know, there's a there was a, a nuclear reactor, um, some kind of you know, thing that Kel Hella made that there's pictures of, she, she did it in clay, yes. you know, and, and, uh, and she did this thing in clay and it perfectly matched the drawing overhead that she was shown after the fact, yes. you know, so, yes. so, yeah. you know, same thing like with ARV, it's like, okay, well draw a picture of what we're going to show you in 30 minutes, Yes. you know, and then, then people do that because it's easy because it's like, it's going to be right there in front of their face. Yeah. So, in my opinion, and it's just an opinion as a layperson, um, probably the way it works is that your subconscious mind goes out and just looks for the easiest answer. You know, it's lazy. Yes. It's going to yes. give you the easiest answer, whatever that is. If it's an article, it's all put nice and neatly in a description for you, even if it's written yep. after you die, that's what it'll be. You know, if it's a, a movie that a whole bunch of people see, that's what it'll be. If, if you think about what Pat Price says, um, you know that Russell has requoted. The more you try to hide something, the bigger the uh, psychic imprint that it makes. I'm, I'm yes. paraphrasing. Yes. Okay, so yes and no, because it's not really the more you try to hide it from the public, it's the more focus you put on it. You yes. know, if if you weren't really that concerned about hiding it and nobody knew about it anyway, you'd probably do a really good job of hiding it. Yes. But if you were super stressed about hiding it and you were putting a lot of effort and a lot of yes. consciousness on intent, hiding it, yes, absolutely. that's a beacon. Yeah. You know, like that becomes a beacon. It's much easier to see than, yeah. than if like just a couple people kind of messed with it and nobody ever really thought much about it and it was gone, you yeah. know? So, so. But on the Hella one with the overpass, you know, she obviously didn't see that as feedback, but when I, I just think about the implications of it in the fact that if that's correct, you know, uh, in her description in say 1973, 1974, she's describing a lot of what you filmed, you know, mm -hmm. recently, Mm -hmm. the the amount of uh things that had to line up events and situations that had to line up over the next two decades to get to you to actually produce that film for her to remote view it mm -hmm. i find that absolutely you know quite mind mind-boggling in its in it in its in its own you know how how all that fits together it's just like whoa the chain of events yeah, but at the same time, I mean, you could probably think of that and think, okay, well, do we even have free will? Is everything preset? Well, that's like, what I'm thinking, yeah. Is it, yeah is, and, is, and it's is like, it predetermined? I, I, I'm more of the fan of the sort of uh, watching sci-fi side of, um, of many worlds, you know, like that the, there's just many possible outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that one happened to be one that was, was, was true, you know, but um to really kind of understand it, I think you have to go outside of remote viewing and, and look at people like Edgar Casey or even Nostradamus, uh, you know, um, anybody that's made um, big ticket uh, predictions about the future, yes. Yes. you know, they're incredibly off usually, you know, but, but they're not always totally wrong. Yes. You know, yes. like, but they can be off. Like, like if we take Fukushima yeah. and, and uh, uh, you know, Edgar Casey, who I'm a big fan of and long before remote viewing, I had read, many, many of his, um, you know, transcriptions of, of yes. his viewings. And we're talking about a guy who was called the sleeping prophet. Yeah. He, he literally would go into a trance with a fifth grade education and then um, spout out like medical remedies and things like that, that, that uh, mainstream science hadn't even invented yet. And in yeah. fact, whole fields of surgery were later invented because of this guy. You can still go to the, the drugstore today and find like tooth powder it says, you know, invented by Edgar Casey, you know, on it, you know, yeah. and, and it's like stuff like that. And um, in this particular instance, Casey predicted that there was going to be a tsunami off the coast of Japan and that this particular part of Japan was going to be submerged underwater. Yeah. And, uh, and he predicted, uh, you know, millions of people were going to die. And it was like this huge tragic event that was going to just completely affect Japan. Yes. And years and years and years later after his death, Yes, there was a tsunami. Yes, it did affect a lot of people. And, and yes, at least temporarily, the water went in and the water yeah. went back out again. Um, yeah. But it wasn't nearly as bad. It was thousands of people dead instead yes. of millions. That and, happens a lot. Yeah, and that happens a lot. You do. Yeah. And, and so what does that suggest? To me, it suggests that 
our act of observation, for one thing, probably has an effect yes. on, on outcomes. And, and uh, maybe it potentially switches us between timelines. Yes. You know, maybe, maybe it takes us off of one track and puts us on another. And maybe profits okay, yeah. are, are simply predicting the worst possible outcome. Yes. You know, um, or uh, maybe unified consciousness as a whole has just gone in a slightly different direction. Yes. You know, that, that takes you away from that outcome. Um, and I tend to just never believe big ticket predictions. Yeah, you know, we don't ourselves now. And I've been involved in, you know, those kind of predictions now for probably going on a decade. Starting, mm -hmm. uh, I think I started mainly with uh, Courtney Brown mm -hmm. uh, and the Farsight. And mm -hmm. I think it was around, in around about 2007 or so, we were doing a project called the Climate Change Project, where we were looking at different points over, over the... Uh, over the globe to see what it would look like in the future climate wise. And one of them was LA uh, uh, three years into the future or so. And when me and the other viewers looked at it, we all said, Oh, we, what we see is an earthquake. Um, and you know, the earthquake magnitude was quite, well, his analysis of it was quite dire, you know? So he put out a prediction saying, okay, on this date in a year's time, there's going to be uh, an earthquake in, in LA, but it's going to destroy everything, you know? The, so, mm -hmm. and that happens with remote viewing. And on that day, a year later, there was an earthquake. Mm -hmm. So he got that correct, but you know, literally only, it only crumbled a couple of buildings and no one died from it. Mm -hmm. And we find that this happens a lot in predictions is the, uh, especially for me in my RV and I've come to notice it now, if I see a major event happening, the, the event I, in my RV data is almost a magnitude 10 times more than what will actually happen in, in, the, in the real event. So mm -hmm. I'll make everyone aware of that now that there will be yeah. an event, but it's going to be way smaller than what I'm reporting yeah. here. Yeah, and I, and I think that, I mean, that might have to do with um, just the level of mass consciousness on the planet in terms of like, I'm not, but I think it also, it, it, it's not just RV. Like uh, if you've ever played with tarot, Yes, like like have, yeah. tarot is is a synchronicity generator just like i ching or or, or something yeah. like that and i think it can probably point to really good results when you're talking about concrete things but when you're saying you know will i make a million dollars in a year you know it, it's like those are probabilities and and usually they're not as accurate and is it because tarot doesn't fully work no i think there's validity to it yeah. but uh are you um is the act of you observing it changing it? You know, mm -hmm. like, are you, are you, by the fact that you've observed it, have you now just prevented the catastrophe? You know, have you, you know, it, yeah. or, or is it just that, you I'm know, a believer in that theory? I, you know, I think that, the, and there's a film, I think there's a film um, called Next with Nicolas Cage. And mm -hmm. There's a quote in that film where, you know, because he, he could see, a, I think he sees 30 seconds in the future. And he's got a quote that they say like about six times right the film that, and he goes, someone along the lines of every time you look at the future, it changes because you've looked at it. Yeah. I truly yeah. That. yeah. 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 And, and so, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but I think it also could just be the, uh, when we talk about more esoteric stuff, like just the vibe, like the vibration of the planet, like where is it at and, yeah. and what's going to happen? You know, like, are we going to wind up in a nuclear Holocaust or are we going to wind up, you, you know, with no atmosphere? Like, what is it? And, you know, it's um, all of those things are possible, but as a planet, I tend to be an optimist that, yes. that we are, we're moving in a more positive direction and all of this chaos, all of this crap that, that we're surrounded by now mm -hmm. is, is kind of like, um, cleaning up, dusting your floor, yes. you know, and, and it, all of this stuff is just coming to the forefront for us to examine and look at and, mm -hmm. and then hopefully move be, beyond, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I'm a big believer in that, you know, it's, yeah. and I kind of have to be to make it through my day, I guess, but, <laughs> but, but it is, it is true. I mean, it, it tends to be true because even in my own life, I mean, and we're going off the subject, I'm sorry, but like in, in my own life, the worst things that have ever happened to me wound up being the things that define who I am now and have made yes. me better, you yeah. know, and, and at the time you go, oh, this is just the worst crud ever, but um, sometimes things need to be shifted around, yes. you know, and, Absolutely. and so you know, um, we'll see where it all goes, but, but it is, it is definitely, I think true that, um, probabilities are a lot harder than when you can verify information, yes, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. like you take, um, like, like recently I had a, um, we occasionally will do like a little small remote viewing, you know, uh, group, you know, just for fun. Yeah. And, um, we had some people that were logging in remotely, you know, and, and, uh, to do it. And, uh, one person that logged in um, lived in another state and um, they were like, okay, 
if anybody's on the East Coast, you need to sell your property immediately. You know, there's there's going to be a tsunami. It's going to hit. You know, and and uh, um, I got actually kind of upset, and I and I said I said no, don't don't. You know, it's like this is, you know, because apparently there was a group of viewers that had all come to this same conclusion. Right. You know that that there was going to be some this massive catastrophe. Yeah. And um. And I, we talked about some of the same things we've been talking about: how these events can change, how it can be a worst yeah. case scenario, not the real scenario we just don't know and it's just a possibility and um you know the person sold their home and they moved away from the east coast and and okay but nothing happened you know yes. and and yeah. and i found out actually that i don't know if this is is, is actually 100 percent why but at least one of the viewers on the on this particular target was um deathly afraid of water right you know okay, and, yeah. and and this and the, and the viewing was like you know millions so many people are going to die of drowning. It's a tsunami. Yes. It's going to happen, yeah. you know? And, and so what if, uh, just the fact that everybody was given the same target identifier, everybody's looking at the same thing. And, and you had one person that has this subconscious thing going on. Yes. You know, did they infect the viewing? You it's know, possible. Did, did that infect it's it? very possible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've so, seen, you know we've we've seen instances that I mean it's hard to verify targets like that, but we have seen instances in remote viewing where that is uh, looks like it might be the most possible thing that happened in, in the in the project. Yeah. Well, I've had uh, two other experiences with that. One was while we were doing something here at our shop years ago. Uh, there was uh, a viewing going on in this room, and there was some people hanging out in the other room. And one of the people hanging out in the other room was just like scanning a baseball game on their phone you know, um, I've, I've maybe like looking at the scores or whatever, yeah. like reading about a baseball game and, uh, the viewing had nothing to do with baseball, but the viewer came back with this weird conglomeration of the real target, which was accurate and baseball images, you know, <laughs> you know so, so, you know, did that person in the other room somehow just put out that vibe yeah. and, and they picked up on the recording of it, you yeah. know? It's amazing, isn't it? We just, you know, we just don't know the the limitations and and the mechanism of this yet. But yeah, it leads uh, leads a lot of opportunities there as well. I think the the thing that we do know is that it's not constrained constrained by space and time, right? I mean, yes. you can go anywhere with this, you yeah. know, and and that is very uh, useful. You know, yes. I mean, it's it's very very useful. Um, the, the the hard part is when you just have no way of proving it. You know, yeah. the, the government was in a very unique position with SRI and with the other remote viewings that they did with the army, because they literally could point a satellite where the remote viewer was saying, and then yep. show was the submarine there or not, yes. you know, and, yep. and it was, you know, um, if you and I talk about a super secret submarine, like the one that Joe McMonagall finds in the, in the movie, yeah. well, you know, maybe it's, there, maybe it's not. It. we'll never know, you yeah. know, and, and, but somebody will, if they were in the government. Yes. You know? that, that is the issue. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about that kind of subject matter, though, um, have I mean, I'm not trying to push you to do projects, but have you ever thought about doing a, a, a different kind of remote viewing documentary, maybe looking at some of the more esoteric stuff out there? Because, you know, there's a lot of stuff with viewers that have seen things, you know, I know we can't uh, validate a lot of it, but a lot of very credible remote viewers have seen lots of stuff on, on things like Moon and, and, and Mars and, yeah. and stuff like that. It, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I read um, early on, I read uh, Penetration by Ingo Swan, you know, yes. which was a, a book that he wrote uh, where he claimed that some of it was fictional to kind of cover up things that he may or may not have seen or known, you know, and uh, so it's hard to say what exactly was fictional or not. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, one of the things he talked about was viewing the backside of the moon and seeing yeah. all of these people here. But that uh, there was an interesting part of that viewing, which is that he looked once and it was there. And then he looked again and it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he, he saw it and then he didn't see it, you know, and, and so I might be able to explain that in a bit more detail. Oh, please, now. please give me, because, uh, you know, I've been investigating uh, the Ingo Swan archives for three years with John Knowles and Deborah Lynn Katz. Mm -hmm. um, and I found some project files in, in his, in his, in his projects. He was doing, he did lots of different journeys to moon, the moon and Mars. And I think we got, I think I got a scope of them now. A lot of the material is not available, but he was doing projects like he did a, a project called Project Moondrop, where mm -hmm. uh, they were trying to validate Clementine uh, satellite photos by by remote viewing. But he also did uh, extra stuff where he went back to the moon 
and mm-hmm. I actually uh, it's not been published yet. I'm going to publish them soon, but I actually have uh, and it was given to me by the cl- the client that paid for the work. Uh, I have uh, remote viewing transcripts of of Ingo going uh, in audio form uh, where he goes back to the moon to a certain specific location, and he has some very detailed conversations with life forms there and he details that they uh they have two different types of telepaths uh, an offensive telepath uh to to i guess extend out towards earth to to do to do stuff but they also have defensive telepaths as well that actually stop people from looking at certain areas on the moon and he goes into great details about a forty thousand year migration and and lots of detail but i'll be i will be publishing this very soon that's interesting and and, and it's like the other but the other uh, issue that like Pat Price, I know, encountered, um, like with the water towers, you know, that he that he remote viewed the, uh, you know, he was remote viewing um, the city of Palo Alto somewhere. And he described these two water towers in the distance. And it wasn't until many years, you know, Russell thought you know, he, he developed, he described the, the dimensions of a pool within inches, you yes. know, that existed, you know, it was. A, um, and then years later, uh, but he also described these water towers down in the detail yeah. wrong. Like they weren't there. You know, the pools were there to the inch, but the water tower is not. No. Years later, Russell Tart gets a book. He opens it up from the city of Palo Alto. It was a gift. Yeah. And, and there's the water towers. And it turns yeah. out that the pool that, that, that Price had been viewing used to be a water treatment plant back like 75 years earlier. Yes. You know, and, and Price got those two things intertwined so so the other thing you have to ask is okay so is this something that's there now on the moon or is this something that will be or is this something that was you know and and it's 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 um i wish there was a way to delineate that further but but yes it's fascinating and this is an area that i've thought about getting into is is um in particular looking at uh the ufo phenomenon and how it relates to both yeah. consciousness in general and and also specifically remote viewing. Yeah, you know? I've done a lot of work on that my, uh, yeah. myself with projects, and um, yeah, it would be and you know with all the latest releases from the uh, the government and you know the Tic Tac stuff and everything, uh, and I've also done some work for uh, the people uh, client work for uh, the uh, TTSA people, the, the you know mm-hmm. that how Putoff is involved with as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. I've actually done some RV work for them, but yeah, there's lots out there. And I think we are getting to a stage now where that would probably be a very, uh, very worthwhile and impactful kind of video, you know, mixing the both because they are absolutely connected to consciousness, yeah. you know, because we know yeah. from the descriptions of the crash craft and stuff that they fly the craft with consciousness. You know, there yeah, are no it, actual physical controls. I forget who it was. Uh, and again, I don't know personally. I mean, I haven't had that kind of experience where I, I can speak definitively on this kind of stuff. But um, I forget who it was that said that um, it's possible that human beings may have this very weak psi ability, um, whereas maybe um, some other extraterrestrial race maybe might have a very specific and harsh psychic ability. But the difference is that our psychic ability um, is like holographic. It's everywhere. You know, yeah. like we, there's no bounds to like what we can see. You know, and 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 uh, at least in the case of the research that's been done, that that pans out that that there is no boundary. I mean, whether you're Ingo Swan looking at the rings of you know uh, Jupiter or you're you're looking yeah, at your, where your keys are, you know, there there doesn't seem to be any lag time, you know, yes. there. And and um, so so yeah, and, and it does when you have people who are very very credible in terms of their viewings, and they've done a lot of really good viewings yeah. that are provable. And then they sh- then they do something that talks about an ET race or something, and it's not provable. Well, you know, it, it, where are you supposed to stop saying, okay, that's accurate? But at the same time, that's you true. have all of this overlay and these other issues, and you yes. can't be one hundred percent certain. So, so you, it, it's very hard to kind of figure out what's real and what's not. Yeah, I think you know, because I've done a lot on this, I think it's only uh, only of use really on cases that have got quite a bit of sufficient feedback you know i think like i think roswell's quite a good one i think you know the the new tic tac event i think that would be a good one because if the remote viewer in session is doing lots of descriptive work and sketches and they absolutely match the event and the shape and size of yes the yes yes, then that, yes you know then there's no reason why the other 10 percent of looking inside the tic tac to see what's in there and describing that there's no reason why that should be wildly off if the other yeah, 90% you're, you're is right because what you're doing is you're and that's what the intelligence community would do is they would yes. they would take 
things they can verify to be true. And then yes. they would have to extrapolate based on what's being added to the conversation. And that's where the remote viewers become really good. Um, but there are, there doubt. are, there's a great handful, you know, like there's the Rendlesham Forest case in, in the UK in 1980, when a UFO landed outside of, of an Air Force base for five nights in a row. You know, there's an audio tape that one of the people took of the night and, you know, you can actually hear yes. him talking of the event, the beams coming down in the ground. They, they're taking radiation readings. So, yeah. we, you know, you have some credible feedback on that to then ally against the uh, remote viewing data. You, you guys should remote view um, Socorro, New Mexico, 1963, uh, Lonnie Zamora. The egg-shaped one, yeah. Yes. Have yeah. you done that one? I haven't yet. That's yeah. the thing of being a remote viewer is I have, I have, I, like, I got a list here of a hundred targets I would love yeah. to work, but yeah. I, I literally have to wait for someone to task it to me because it has to be blind. I, I, uh, um, I worked on, uh, I produced, co-wrote, and edited a documentary. I didn't direct it, uh, called The Phenomenon, um, which yeah. was directed by James Fox. I saw that and, one. Yeah. Um, I spent probably about eight months or a year. That's another reason why I didn't do some stuff with some of this extra footage I have is because I was literally hired to go, you know, work on this uh, project. And, and um, James is an amazing in, in, uh, investigative journalist. I mean, he, his problem was the same problem I had with Third Eye Spies in that there was just an abundance of yeah. material that he had gathered over seven, eight years. And um, so I was able to spend a lot of time looking in depth at a lot of these cases, you yeah. know, um, like the Tic Tac case, Lonnie yes. Zamora, uh, so many of these cases. And um, James is very nuts and bolts. And um, I think he's been beaten up enough in the past in terms of people trying to destroy his credibility and talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, a little bit different now, but back in the day that yes. that uh, everything has to be like 60 minutes when he does it. I mean, it has to be documented, real, no fluff, no, um, you know, speculation, no nothing. We're just going to show the, just the facts, man, yeah. you know, but, but um, a lot of stuff I know gets left out of those cases yeah. because um, it's so weird that, that you wouldn't believe it had you known everything, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and it, it's like in, in the phenomenon, there's an instance where um, this guy just took a photo of a UFO. That's all it is a great Polaroid. Um, taken the same day as a landing in um, Australia, this, in a schoolyard in Australia. Yeah. And uh, he just happened to be, you know, nearby in his yard taking photographs with a Polaroid of flowers. And he looks up and here's this thing in the air and he takes a Polaroid, great photo. Uh, it got out at the time of the um, event in like the 60s. Yeah. And it appeared in a newspaper or something. And he got some harassment from who he said were government people to, to give yeah. him the photo. His father at the time, I guess, was a high-ranking Australian official, so they didn't, they couldn't bother him that much. Um, but he still went underground with it and never talked about it again until today, until yeah. the movie. And he said the reason was because of all the weirdness that happened just around him taking the photo. You know, it, it's like somehow that photo created a rip in reality, you know, or something. And and then uh, he said he was having like uh, poltergeist experiences in, in his house yeah. where stuff would yeah. fly around and bang in the walls. Uh, he said that literally at three o'clock in the morning, he was awakened by a loud banging at his front door and he goes and opens it up and it's a little person, like a, um, a, a dwarf dressed in a Victorian looking gown. Yeah. And, and the guy looks agitated and he's, and he's pointing his finger and he's yelling at him in his dialect that he can't understand. And, and the guy then gets frustrated and turns around and walks back up the, uh, the steps of his porch. And as he's watching him, he literally disappears in thin air, you know? And, yeah. and so, and he said, he said, I never wanted to have anything to do with any of this stuff. And I never wanted to talk about it again, because I don't want any weirdness, you know? <laughs> and, and yet the weirdness seems like it's just following the phenomenon. And you hear cases yeah. like that all the time and people Absolutely. don't talk about it because it's way too weird, yeah. you know? And, and people would think, okay, you had a psychotic break and that's it. But you know, it's, it's, um, it suggests that reality itself is not set up the way that we think it is, yes. you know, and, and so am I looking at a version of the moon in this reality, or is there some in between reality that we don't know about? You know, I don't know, but, but it's, it's, yeah. even when you look at the different interpretations that say, um, come out of different hypnotic regressions, yes. you, you know, like you, you have like different you got John Mack on one side, who was a very credible Harvard uh, yep. psychologist, 
and you got like uh, Bud, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bud Hopkins, Bud, Bud Hopkins or uh, Dave yeah. Jacobs, you yeah. know, on the other side, and they're not actually trained uh, yes, hypnotherapists, yes. and they get completely different perspectives from their yes, their yes. their sessions. You know, one they're evil bad guys, one they're not. You know, um, Dolores Cannon. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Dolores Cannon. I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was a huge fan of Dolores Cannon's books. You know, right, for, yep, for years yep. I read her books, and um, the interesting thing about her work and how it kind of relates to this whole topic is that she found that when she regressed somebody to the very deepest form of um, what she called, I think, superconscious, you know, um, whatever, that she would be having a conversation yep. with that consciousness. The session would end, the person would leave, the next person would sit down, she would hypnotize them, and the conversation would pick up right where it left off. <laughs> Yeah. So it, in, a, in a sense, it was like a kind of a reverse channeling because, yes. yeah. you know, she, she was talking to something that was able to communicate with her through two totally different people or, yes. or multiple yes. different people. And um, that suggests that we're connected, all of us, in, in some sort of way that we don't understand. And, oh, yes. and so yes. when we're remote viewing, it's like we're tapping into that super conscious it's yep. like our Google, you know, and but is that then being contaminated? And and, on the, and those are all questions that we need to ask. I know it, it just muddies the waters, doesn't it? It's it's yeah. a it's it's a crazy situation. Something I yeah. need to ask though is um the documentary it goes quite in depth uh, and it's almost like a memorial really to uh, to the life and the work of Pat Price. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kind of I, I think it kind of lead leads the or or it gave me the overall impression that everyone that was involved seems to think that there was something probably I, I use the word nefarious something something strange happened in the oh, yeah. in the in sure. the death of pat price yeah. is is that is that the feeling you got from it in the end after doing all the all the research and the, and the, the um work? man i don't know i mean um anytime you talk to anybody in the intelligence community especially if they're still involved in some way yeah. it's like peeling away layers of an onion you know, um, they themselves probably don't know what the truth is, you know, and, and if they do, you're, you're only getting this little portion of it. And, yeah. and, um, you know, um, if you pay close attention to third eye spies, it, it's subtle, but, um, there is a reference there that, um, there's a title that comes up after Kit Green gives his description of what happened to Pat Price, that, that his description is completely at odds with Hal and Russell's recollection. Yeah. Because um, I'm, what I'm talking about is his body. Yes. You know, because because uh, Kit told me a very detailed story of his body being cremated. Yeah. You know, and and uh, before they notified the wife, basically, like yeah. bombshell information. I was like, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, um, I did research after that, and and my research just by looking it up online showed that he was buried in uh, like North Hollywood. Right. And uh, and I called the cemetery. It was he is he in an urn? You know, is he, is he, you know, you know, somewhere above ground? And they said, no, no, it's a casket and here's his casket. And, and so, and then I asked Russell and I asked Hal, you know, um, do you remember, you know, him being cremated? You know, no. Um, I remember it being an open casket at his funeral. And Russell said it was the only time I had ever seen a body in an open casket. So I remember it pretty well, Right. you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you know, I, I don't know, you know, yeah. I, I don't know why that was. But, but um, you get conflicting stories. And, yes. and uh, what I do know is that Pat was compromised by his church. Yes. You know, he, he yes. was, I don't think he was intentionally a double agent or, you know, intentionally doing wrong, but yes. you, you know, you go to your priest and you want to confess everything and mm -hmm. someone's taken notes, you know, and, and that was the thing that I think turned, um, Ken Cress off more than anything else to ever talking about remote viewing again. Right. Yeah. He's incredibly bitter about it because his name was all over the files that were yes. covered from Pat's church. Yes. And, and uh, he said, you know, this guy was putting me in danger, you know, yes. because I was deeply undercover and he was putting me in danger by mm -hmm. saying my name, yeah. you know, and, and um, so you'll have the, that's one thing. And then we also know that, the CIA from the very beginning only was paying SRI because they thought it was fake. 
you know, they thought yeah. they were being hoaxed by the Russians. Yes. You know, um, yes. when you look at the Defense Department and materials that have been released from um, what was going on in the Soviet Union, you know, yeah. uh, Dale Graf like had written these massive reports on 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 all of the information the intelligence community had, DIA had. You're talking like something like 75, 80 different laboratories yeah. all over the Soviet Union dedicated to doing nothing but studying psychic ability, telekinesis, how to use psi offensively to hurt people. Yes. That was their whole thing, which DIA was saying, yeah, their, their research wasn't really panning out. They were doing also some remote viewing, but not as widespread. You know, the United yeah. States was doing all of this defensive stuff and uh, information gathering, you know, um, inbound stuff, not outbound, Sai. Yes. Um, yes. But at the beginning, they paid SRI to basically prove that everything the Russians were doing was a smokescreen to yep. get the U.S. to waste money. Um, time after time after time, SRI was proving that it was real. Yeah. And, and uh, even then, they were not convinced. When, when um, Pat Price did his first big remote viewing at Semipalatinsk, the thing with the Gores, yep. they were convinced there was something going on, but, but Ken Kress still believed it was just a leak. You know, like there, maybe it's just a leak, you know, like somebody's feeding Pat Price this information. Yeah. So yeah. What, what did they do though? They had a guy who had proven something that shouldn't be provable. Um, so what did they do? They sequestered him away. They literally removed him from his life. You know, like they, they, uh, Pat Price said, oh, I'm very excited. I'm going to go work for the government. I'm going to uh, Washington. I'm going to a ranch right outside of, uh, in Virginia in the rural areas that near Washington, DC, and they're going to yes. watch yeah. me and all this. Uh, Russell went and visited um, Pat there. And he said there were armed people following him around. You know, like they were, it was literally like a, like a spy movie, you yeah, know, like he was yeah. being monitored every single step. And, um, and, and that entire time he was sequestered, they were bringing him files and they were saying, yeah. okay, do this remote viewing, do this remote viewing. And Pat thought he was just working with CIA, but they were still testing Pat. Yeah. You know, they, they wanted to know, okay, in now in completely our controlled circumstances, not some contractor over here, yes. but in yeah. our circumstances, let's see what he does. And, um, he remote viewed um, the interior of the Libyan embassy, you know, that, that they had purposely tasked him for because that embassy had been broken into by yeah. a team of U.S. agents and they had placed bugs. And, yeah. and so um, they had the guy who had broken in monitor his results yes. and, and then go and interview Pat about what he had seen after the fact. And uh, he convinced that guy that, yes. that that guy said, look, only a guy who has literally been in that room would know the details. He's telling me the wallpaper. He's telling me the color of the carpet. He's telling me things that I know because I've been in that room, yes. you know, and, yep. and, uh, and he also said stuff that the intelligence agencies didn't know, like the fact that there were trainings going on in the Libyan desert for terrorists and mm, yep. things like that. Well, three days after that, or it was not maybe three days, I forget how many now, but like short time after that, Pat was dead. Yeah. You know, so um, was that the Russians that, that knew that, that he was actually the guy that could, could reveal secrets? Yeah. Was it um, so his church, you know, who, who uh, you know, maybe he wasn't uh, on good terms with anymore? You know, was yep. it something else? Was it the government? I don't know. You know, um, I have no idea. I would hope not. And I, and I don't want to go there, but, but uh, I, I would say that um, it certainly is plausible that he died of a heart attack, yes. you know, because everybody that I interviewed said, yeah. you know, look, the guy was totally unhealthy. He smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. Yes. You know, he was eating donuts for breakfast. You know, he, he, his health was not his primary concern. Yeah. So um, sure. It could have been a heart attack. I don't know, but, but um it also could have been that someone realized they had Superman on their team, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and that there's no hiding from Superman, you know, or it yep. could be that Superman is a double agent, you know, with more secrets, a yeah. fascinating yep. spy novel, but, but we will never know, you know, um, uh, I mean, there's other people that say, Hey, maybe Pat Price was just taken further into isolation and worked for another 20, 30 years in some bunker, you know, yes. like, I mean, you yes. don't know, yes. but what we do know is that, a couple of days, I think on the airport uh, of his last trip, you know, he bought a life insurance policy yeah. for a million dollars or something like that. You know, he, he bought a, a uh, cause I guess back in the day, there'd be people at airports selling life insurance, you know? <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, and so he, 
bought the life insurance policy. He called his family and said goodbye in a way that sounded like he wasn't coming back. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that suggests that he knew. And, and, you know, I interviewed Uri Geller about this. It's in the movie. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Uri Geller um, said, well, look, maybe the guy, you know, is psychic. I mean, he's the greatest psychic in the world. Maybe he knew that he was about to die. Yeah. And, yeah. and he just, you know, did that. But, but uh, it certainly sounds suspect. He was on his way to SRI when he was, when he, when he died, you know, yeah. he was, uh, he made a stop over in Vegas. He was going to go to SRI in Palo Alto to see uh, Hal and, and Russell. And um, yeah, yeah, he didn't make it. So um, I think we also have to ask, how useful is remote viewing? You know, and I think your audience would probably be saying right now, yeah, it's really useful. It's great. You know, we're, we're patrons. We, we, we like this stuff. And, and um, there's certain scientists that would agree with that. Yeah. But um, is it useful enough that the government would keep doing it? You know, and, and uh, yeah. the other thing that came out in the documentary, I was very surprised by that it even was allowed out uh, because when I interviewed Ken, before Ken would consent to the interview, Ken Kress, the CIA monitor, yeah. uh, every single thing that we talked about had to be cleared and vetted by CIA. Right. Um, you know, he said, he said, give me a list of questions that you want to ask. He says, I will take that list to CIA and they will either say yes or no. And, yeah. and he said, and I gave him a list of questions and then he called me back and he said, yeah, I'm going to add to your list of questions. I'm going to add the stuff that I want to talk about and, and then see if that clears you know yes. and and so he sent that to cia and surprisingly they approved everything you know they approved oh, yeah. everything no 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 wait i'm sorry they approved everything that we talked about in the documentary but um ken said there was a whole additional list of things he wanted to talk about that they didn't approve or deny but just never got back to him on right you know, okay. so, yeah. so he couldn't talk about that yeah but yeah. um one of the things that came out through that approval process um right in his written thing was that there were at least two other people at CIA that were doing remote viewings for CIA. Right. Um, yeah. And, and these were both people that originally had gone out to CIA to a SRI uh, as um, monitors from CIA okay. yeah. to observe. Yeah. Um, both of them got put to work doing remote viewings and yes. uh, cause that's just what they did with everybody that came in. Yes. And, and uh, both of them tried very hard to prove that it wasn't real, but, decided that it was i mean there's a great story that's not even in the um movie that that hal tells there was just no time um about how one of the two this woman um came out as as a cia monitor and they did a remote viewing with her she just nailed it and then she said okay i'm gonna do that again and then the next time she comes in and she does it and this time um she's like, like i want you to tape the door shut I want you to, um, I'm going to put on like, you know, noise canceling earphones because you might be feeding me signals, you know, like, so they went and did the remote viewing and this time they came back and she's literally in her underwear, crouched <laughs> in a corner, like doing this, you know, because uh, she was convinced that they were somehow feeding her some yes. subliminal signal yeah. or something and they weren't and she was able to do it and then she kept doing it. Those guys went back to CIA, to CIA and they were working with Pat when he died. Right. Yeah. So, so they had. So it wasn't just Pat because the official story yeah. is, okay, so Pat died and that was the end of the whole thing. And that's what Ken believes. You know, Ken, okay. I honestly believe yeah. believes that that was the end of the whole thing. But you have these other two people that are kind of like off in the distance that you yep. kind of just never hear from again. Neither one of them would consent to an interview. You know, there nobody knows about who they are. Um, yeah. Then you have other- you have Ingo's statement as, as well. He, he made several statements that- uh... And it's in the book by Jim Mars. And I asked him this personally as well, but after I read the Jim Mars statement, but in the book, Jim Mars, he said that uh, he trained a second unit at SRI of remote viewers. He said they worked, uh, they were like engineers with it, but they were way better than the military remote viewers. And Mm -hmm. once he trained them, they disappeared and he didn't even know their names or anything. And they just disappeared. He never heard from them again. I I will say that um, I could probably say that I did, try to get an interview with one person um, who, who claimed it was still going on and wouldn't consent to the interview, you know? And, and so again, I'm just a lay person. I don't know if it's really going on, but, but it sounds to me like um, what, if I was them, here's what I would do. I would take away any liability um, that, that is a leaky ship. And SRI, I know from multiple interviews was constantly considered the leaky ship. 
you yeah. know, because they're contractors, you know, yeah. and Russell was a scientist more interested in uh, the reality of ESP than, than yes. whether or not it'll catch spies or something. Yes. Um, uh, so Russell was out, you know, um, over the years, I think the army program was also considered an incredibly leaky ship, you know, and um, Dale Graff told me this multiple times that, that uh, uh, the army guys were temporary. Yes. You know, they, they're from another unit, they come in, they learn this incredible thing called remote viewing. Yep. Um, and then they get out of the army and they want to write a book or Absolutely. they want to like teach people or they want to yeah. talk about it or they want to make a movie, which is, you know, what, and, and that's exactly know, what, what happened. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's what was happening. And, and um, when I interviewed anybody from CIA, the impression within CIA was that the army unit was just not good. There was this huge rivalry going on between Absolutely. the army and CIA. And I was very surprised actually though, to learn that um, the biggest client of the army was the CIA. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to be honest, uh, and you know, I've read all the Stargate materials and the Ingo archives and stuff. That viewpoint is backed up quite well with the documentation that's there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 uh, so, on the one hand, you literally had the head of the CIA going before Congress, and and calling you know this remote viewing program a wild goose chase, and you know we need to end this. It's the Golden Fleece Award, it's the stupidest project ever funded and how can you guys possibly support this and then behind the scenes this the same guy is like ordering remote viewings left and right and like the yeah. cia is using it you know yeah. and, as was every other intelligence agency and 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 that's kind of the problem is that because of how and russell's contacts within government because of prior work yeah. um they had lots of places to go to get funding in government to do remote viewings so yes. over here you have this the, the professionals in the cia going you know, God, we can't get rid of these guys. Like, you know, like we, we, we canceled the thing when Pat Price died, yeah. you know, but yet they keep going in these other formats. And so it became kind of like, um, they really wanted to get rid of the army program, you know, in CIA, you know, and, and C uh, army was getting a lot of the like crap cases and, and things that were really hard to prove still doing a good job, but, um, they weren't doing much. They were having no funding, nothing. Dale Graff was really worried towards the end because, I mean, people were trying to sneak on the base and try to see where the remote viewers were because their work was becoming so well known. And they were in this like little shack, you know, in the back. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so the public face of remote viewing became a problem yes. for somebody, you know, yeah. because it, it just was um, a leaky ship. So yeah. what did they do? They canceled the army thing. They canceled SRI's funding. SRI was still doing stuff in the periphery, but um, it allowed the government to say, okay, this just doesn't work. And it was yeah. kind of all just a big myth to begin with and, and whatever. Yeah. So if I was them, what I would have done is I would have pulled the people from the periphery that were not publicly known, not Joe McMonagles, not Russell Targs, not yes. any of those yes. guys, yeah. because yeah. those guys already were out and, and doing public research that was being published. Yeah, they were you know, um tainted but, by that stage yes but the thing is sri was doing stuff like training these contractors at cia <laughs> yeah. they were um working with physicists from the next lab over yeah. you know like one, one of the things that um i asked uh, skip atwater when uh, we interviewed him was you know what makes a good remote viewer and and he said basically it's anybody that that is fairly normal you know, um, fairly well adjusted, not, not the crazy psychic in a corner with a crystal ball, you know, just, just yeah. somebody who is excels at anything, you know, could be they're an engineer, could be they're a photographer, could be whatever it is, but if they're well liked, excel in their career, whatever it is, probably they're, they're relatively smart, you know, then they are going to be yeah. able to do a decent remote viewing. And, and, um, you know, they sent out a, when they started the army program, they sent out a questionnaire uh, to, I think 40,000 service members, yeah. you know, um, and it was, it was, uh, in the guise of like a puzzle and a raffle or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and they got back like six or 7,000 applicants and, and they filtered that down to the 30 people that started the army program, yeah. you know? So, um, so they understood how to get remote viewers. They understood all of those things. But, uh, if you ask me, probably it's just continued under another guise. I would not be a bit surprised, by the way, if you yourself and your group hasn't already done some sort of classified remote viewing, 
you know, it's incredibly possible mm -hmm. because again, yeah. if I was the government, what I would do is not wanting to embarrass myself by spending lots of money on a program answerable to Congress. I would just piecemeal out little tiny sparks here and there. Yes. Um, and, and now there's enough groups that are out there that are doing this yes. for corporate Absolutely. clients, for legal firms, all, all these kinds of things that um, maybe now and then I'll hit on something. And yeah. then I can just feed that back into the food chain, you know, um, as human intelligence and see what, what, what pans of it. And if, and if something pans out, then I'll go back to you and do it again. And then if Absolutely. maybe in like five years, you turn out to be the next Pat Price, then we sequester you away somewhere. You know, yeah. I don't know. Well, I hope not. I haven't been uh, approached so far. Um... But yeah, you're right. You just never know, you know. And the fact is, you know, most reviewers work blind. You tend mm -hmm. not to know. Sometimes, you know, you might be given a target if it's if you're doing it blind, like a lot of people do over the internet. I don't, mm -hmm. but you know, some people do. And you know, you don't know if the if the feedback they're giving you is for the real target or or if they're taking the information that you've given them and they're doing something right. else with it. That's right. Yeah, I, I could very easily tomorrow uh, task you and say. Um, I've got a friend and um, I'm worried about their health and uh, this is where they're at. Could you just, you know, uh, yeah. do a remote viewing for me? And maybe that's not a, a friend. Maybe it's some ambassador to Russia or something. I mean, Absolutely. you know, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know that. yeah. <laughs> and, and I think you do have to be careful. I think there is a morality to tasking remote viewers. I mean, you know, Ingo talks about, you know, accidentally being tasked on a volcano or something and, you know, being traumatized by that or, or a Chinese, uh, facility where people were being tortured yeah yeah i remember seeing the, uh, a video many years ago uh, in 95 that he did uh and he was almost in tears when he was talking about the uh the torture scenes he saw, he saw mm -hmm. in the video and stuff yeah, so it was... it's it's a it's really a question of um yeah what is it useful for i mean another getting back to the ufo thing for a minute um you know most remote viewers if they do it long enough they have some sort of story about you know ufos and and uh i think that the really big missing link there is consciousness. You know, like you were saying, like maybe the craft is, you know, um, I think you have to be careful even with that, you know, in, in tasking and stuff like that. I think that, yeah. but uh, I'm sure that that is the connective tissue to this whole thing, which makes it yes, I think so. yeah. very, very probably protected and secret because, um, you know, you can look at anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. well it's been great chatting to you i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go in a minute because we've been at this an hour and a half and you know i don't want to keep you too long but yeah we should definitely get together and do do another chat along the theme of this because uh it's great and i think you've shared some great information that you know i know the people that watch my youtube stuff are gonna are gonna love getting these insights and we're, thank you uh, and i can't wait until we uh see this extended version of the video as well and as i said you know maybe maybe if you need some extra funding crowdfunding it with the rv community might be a a way to go about this as well. Yeah, um, I will definitely keep that in mind, and and um, and and let's stay in touch on on that and on other things too. Because, uh, like I said, I love the stuff that you guys are doing, and I and I like watching a lot of the remote viewings that you guys do that are sort of unprovable, just yeah. because it's fun, you know, to to sort of put pieces together and and. Do I think you have to push the boundaries a little bit now yeah. and again. Yeah. Yeah, but but we I think it's just like with anything. It's like moderation in all things. It's like yes. you, you can't get too worked up. Yes. I will say one last thing. It's like something else I learned is that um if you're going to be a remote viewer, set and setting is very important. Having a discipline is very important. You know, yeah. like having um sort of a um grounding is very important. You know, yes, because definitely. uh it, it's like like uh John McMonagall said in one of his books you can't take away somebody's worldview without giving them something else. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and unfortunately I think what we're seeing in the world now is the floor is kind of being ripped out from so many people in so many different ways yeah. that they're grasping onto a lot of things. Yes. And, yeah. and it's remote viewing can be very powerful, but it can also be kind of sexy and tantalizing and, and take you away from your ground. Yes, and yes, and yes. It, with as with anything like that, and and I think Absolutely. it's just so important for people to stay grounded, you know, stay, um, you know, um, using this kind of stuff in fun as much as anything else, because yes. it's 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 not a uh, end all be all. You know? Absolutely, yeah, and you know, every I try to everything or every kind of project we kind of work, I try to have a balance in everything. Um, mm -hmm. So half my life is spent doing at the moment 
markets and cryptos and arv and then it's great every once in a while like you know i publish ones for the hellfire group where we look at a ufo or a mystery target so i get that kind of balance because to be honest my life would be so dull if it was just arv and money targets all the time yeah yeah Yeah. and that's and that is the thing isn't it that that um it's so much nicer to live in a world that that has possibility and mystery in it yes you know it's like it keeps things from being dull you know, and, and it's like, if, I prefer that if we knew all the answers, I think it, it would be boring to be honest. Yeah. 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 I, like, I like the fact that RV keeps us uh, guessing. And I, I've mentioned this with some people as well. Over the 25 years of doing RV now, I, I've come to the belief system that there is, it almost feels like the, the process itself is conscious in its own mind mm-hmm. and it plays tricks on us. There's a trickster element, you know, yeah. when we think we're getting there and we think we're getting the right answer to knowing what's happening. It, mm-hmm. it, it flips the switch on us so that we yes. don't even as a laugh on our on our on our behalf yeah i mean i, I think that uh you're right and i think that that uh it's just like, again like going back to the ufo phenomenon like when you think you have it figured out there's a there is a trickster element there yeah. that that uh um i mean like jacques valet you know who i got to work with on the phenomenon um yeah. you know he one of the world's authorities on on ufo research going back to the 50s yeah. and uh he no longer believes it's extraterrestrial because he says it's too, there's too much of a trickster element there. Like somebody will see something and there's like a symbol on the craft and then maybe they'll write that down and then he'll research it and figure out it's a cow brand, you know, or, or something like that. It's like, there's, there's a, you know, he, he's much more in the line of sort of, I think holographic universe theory than, than anything else now, because it's, it's just too much weirdness. You know, like uh, if you, if you, if you have like one more moment, I I was, I was going to share something I was talking about, earlier, which doesn't directly apply, but just applies to the kind of weirdness of the world, um, is the Mandela effect. Have you heard of that? Yes. You guys ever yeah. viewed that? Yeah. Oh, no, I, haven't um, revu- I haven't remote viewed it. No, but I, I've read up, read up on it. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that like I was reading a book um, and the phrase in the book, it wasn't the Bible. It was another book about biblical. It was on, on Edgar Ca- uh, Casey, actually. Yep. And, and uh, Casey quoted something saying something like the lion shall lay down with the lamb. You know, yeah. is that in the Bible? I think it is, isn't it? At, no, no <laughs> wrong answer. Because I went I've, to see. I've heard that before several times. Oh no, no, it's a lot of people have, and and I went to CCD as a kid. Yeah. I remember that phrase. You know, Catholic school. Yeah, you know, I remember that phrase from from the Bible. Then um, King James version of the Bible, where I learned it, and and uh, um, uh, and I remember reading it recently in a book. And then I I happened upon some video online, and some preacher was saying. He was literally crying and he was saying, you know, this phrase was there and now it's not, you know, it's, it's in my own personal copy of the Bible. It's not there. So I, I went, well, that's can't be true because I remember that statement myself. And I went and I got my copy of this book and I opened it up and it had been changed to the wolf shall lay down with the sheep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Never even heard that phrase before, yeah. but, um, and, and you find all these little residual things in yeah. culture yeah. that still reference the, the first version but in my own book, it's not there. So, I mean, did I just, I mean, okay. My rational self says I just must be remembering. Right. But no, cause I've heard it. I, oh, yeah. it, it, it is the trickster in, in play, isn't it? It's very strange. It is. It's a, what, what it suggests is a, we can't trip out too much on anything because yeah. if, if you get too worked up about it, what are you going to do? You know, it's yeah. like, it's like the world's weird, man. I mean, it's just weird, yeah. but um, on, and, and then also it just suggests that reality is not set up the way that we think it is. Absolutely, and, yeah. and uh, there is other things at play that yeah. um, things are a little bit amorphous. You just have to kind of ride the waves and yeah, go. And yeah. Then, yeah. Well, it's been great chatting to you. Uh, we should yeah. definitely do this again. Um, and yeah, if you need any help with anything you're doing, please don't hesitate to, uh, you know, reach out to us. I, I will do that. I will do that. It, that hadn't even occurred to me. And I appreciate the offer. Thank you very much. And, yeah, um, no, no you know, it's like, I have a YouTube channel. It's called, it's just my name, Lance Mangia. Um, and uh, I'm, um, I'm a subscriber of that. What I'll do is I'll put that link in and link to your, uh, your for thy spies. We, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll speak offline. I'll get some links to where people can, you know, access that off, off of yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually when I post stuff up about thy spies, there's a few, um, I put some, some behind the scenes, or um, sorry, some uh, um, extended clips and stuff. Like there's a clip on ARV on there yeah. uh, with Marty. You know, yeah, I've watched and, all those. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, and eventually I'll be putting more stuff up. I just, I just haven't, you know, it's like a- Excellent, yeah. Hot yeah the more the better. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to your audience yeah. for if they watch this long. And Thanks for uh, taking the time and sharing, sharing all that information with us. It'd be, it'd be great to get that out there.
Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, a, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. You have a good rest of the day and take care. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.